Hello, and welcome to Walking Through the Bible. Have you ever wondered, is it better from a spiritual sense to remain unmarried? Sure, it is not sinful to marry, for God is the creator of marriage. But is one more spiritual to remain unmarried, like Jesus did, or like Paul did? The reason it's important to consider this is because there are some in the religious world, especially among the denominations, that don't allow their clergy to marry, that seem to think, or at least very, or at least imply by their practice, that one cannot be fully attending to the things of God while at the same time being married. So if you have a Bible with you, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to be dealing with this question by reading verses 29 through 40. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry, just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning at verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on even those who have wives should be as though they had none, those who weep as though they did not weep, those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use this world as not misusing it. For the form of this world is passing away, but I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. But if any man thinks he is behaving improperly towards his virgin, if she is past the flower of, her, uh, of youth, and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let them marry. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin, does well. So then he who gives her in marriage does well. But he who does not give her in marriage does better. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she has a liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment. And I think I ha also have the Spirit of God. So much division occurs between Christians and those who profess to be Christians when we fail to consider the whole context of the chapter which in this case is persecution. Many people from this chapter conclude that on the whole, Paul discourages Christians to get married, though not calling it sinful. But he does no such thing. In fact, in Ephesians, he is going to compare marriage between a man and a woman to the marriage between Christ and his church. What this chapter is dealing with is a question sent to Paul by the Corinthians concerning marriage and persecution. Let's therefore not twist Paul's words into thinking that being unmarried means that we're more spiritual than those who are married, for Paul doesn't say that. Sure, Paul does say that the unmarried have more time to devote to the Lord, but that doesn't make the unmarried more spiritual. It simply means that the unmarried have more time, not having a wife and children to care for, and that they should therefore use that time to use their talents in the Lord's service. The married, though, are called to be just as spiritual as the unmarried, but God recognizes that part of their duties will involve caring for the physical and spiritual needs of their wife and children, which, by the way, is doing the will of God just in a different way than the unmarried do. In truth, living as a Christian in times of persecution is what this entire section is talking about. In verses 29 to 31, Paul tells them that life on this earth is short, especially during times of persecution. And so Paul tells them to prepare for a time when you will not be married, which is in heaven. Don't dwell too much on sadness, because in heaven there will be no more sadness. On the flip side, don't get too over-exuberant uh, over with rejoicing of the things of this life, whether possessions or power, for the things of this earth will be passing away. This is the section that leads into Paul's discussion of the married and unmarried state. Paul is simply stating facts, not which group is more spiritual. So if, li if you're listening and are unmarried, whether man or woman, being in that state is not sinful. 
but do use your time to attend to more spiritual things, such as personal spiritual growth or fulfilling your role in the church. Do not be in, in, become involved in sexual immorality, for in doing so, you are sinning by defiling your body, just as we discussed in chapter 6. If you later choose to marry, do so with gladness. But if you don't, you're still not sinning. In times of persecution, however, it is better not to be married due to the fact that you can move around easier and escape, not being burdened by having to provide and care for, for your family. If you're listening, though, and are married, your first duty is still to God. Simply because you have a wife and possibly children doesn't mean that you have an excuse to neglect spiritual things. On the contrary, you have additional responsibilities given to you by God. Ephesians will tell you that you are to love your wife if you're a man and respect and obey your husband if you're a woman, following the example of Christ. You're also to raise up any children you have in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. These things are important and must not be neglected, which means that you must be growing as Christians and living as Christians in order to do this properly. Also among your responsibilities is to care for the physical needs of your family, which is why Paul said that during times of persecution, like that facing the Corinthians, it was better not to be married. But to the married, they were to remain married, for that's what God expected. They just need to realize that their lives might be harder. None of this section says anything about the married state of preachers, elders, or deacons in the church. Catholics believe that Paul is teaching here that priests and bishops must remain unmarried. Quoting from one of their websites, we read this, The reasons Latin Rite priests can't marry and bo are both theological and canonical. Theologically, it may be pointed out that priests serve in the place of Christ and therefore their ministry specifically configures them to Christ. As is clear from Scripture, Christ was not married, except in the mystical sense, to the church. By remaining celibate and devoting themselves to the service of the church, priests more closely model, configure themselves to, and consecrate themselves to Christ. As Christ himself makes clear, none of us will be married in heaven, Matthew 22, verses 23 to 30. By remaining unmarried in this life, priests are more closely configured to the final eschatological state that will be all of ours. Paul makes it very clear that remaining single allows one's attention to be undivided in serving the Lord, 1 Corinthians 7, 32-35. He recommends celibacy to all, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 7, but especially to ministers who, are, uh, who as soldiers of Christ he urges to abstain from civilian affairs, 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, unquote. There are many errors in doctrine found in statements like these, such as bishops in the church and what they call priests, standing in place of Christ, but we'll deal with those in the future lessons when we talk about elders and deacons in more detail. What I'd like us to see here, though, is their misuse of 1 Corinthians 7. Paul does recommend celibacy in this chapter, but in context, it's during times of present distress. But even if Paul desired that more people be able to be single like he is or like Christ was, the topic is not preachers or bishops. The topic is all Christians, and he is quite clear that one does not sin by marrying. Why then does the Catholic Church make its priests take vows of celibacy when Paul makes no such command here in this chapter, or even Im imply of doing so? In fact, when we get to 1 Timothy and Titus concerning the qualifications of elders and deacons, one of the qualifications of those offices are that they are married. Even Peter, who the Catholics wrongly claim was the first pope, was married, as we saw in the Gospels. So this idea that those who minister in the gospel and serve in the local church must not be married is not found here in 1 Corinthians 7, as that is not the topic of a conversation, nor is it taught anywhere else in the New Testament either, which we will see in future studies. What is in view is marriage during times of persecution. What about those engaged to be married, those who are single but approaching the end of their childbearing years, and those who are widows? What of them in these times of persecution? Well, in that time especially, women had to be given away in marriage by their fathers. Thus, the father might tell his daughter that during this time of persecution, he was not going to permit her to get married, and thus, especially if the daughter was a Christian, she was expected to be obedient 
to her father. Yes, we live in a different culture today, but such was the culture then. However, father wouldn't sin by giving his daughter away to be married, even during times of persecution, something that would be doubly true if she were approaching the end of her childbearing years. Yes, Paul again said it was better not to marry during this time of persecution, but notice he said that he who gives her in marriage still does well, showing us that Paul is not saying there's anything wrong with marriage, even in times of persecution, nor is he saying that the unmarried are more spiritual, which leaves us with widows. Here Paul reminds us, like he did in Romans chapter 7 and earlier in this chapter, that marriage is for life and a wife is bound by, the, by law to her husband so long as he lives. Otherwise, she would be an, an adulteress, barring Jesus' exception in Matthew 19, 9, which is not under discussion here. If her husband dies, she is at liberty to marry whoever she wills, only in the Lord. This phrase, only in the Lord, has caused a little bit of a disagreement as to what Paul means. Is he saying that widows can only marry those who are in the Lord, meaning Christians? Is he saying that she can only marry those whom the Lord permits? In other words, only those with a right to marry. Knowing what Paul is saying here is important for us to understand, for I am sure that nobody who is a Christian wants to break the Lord's commands. To examine this phrase a little better, let's see how it is used in other places in Scripture. In Revelation chapter 14, at verse 13, there we read, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works follow them. When examining the context of that passage, it is clear that the phrase, In the Lord, means as a Christian. Blessed are those who die as a Christian from now on. But just because the phrase in the Lord means as a Christian in Revelation 14 verse 13 doesn't mean that the phrase carries the same meaning everywhere. To illustrate this point, let's come to Ephesians 6 verse 1. In that verse, Paul writes, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. The phrase in the Lord is in that passage as well. But if we apply the meaning of Revelation 14, verse 13 to Ephesians 6, verse 1, we would either come away with only children who are Christians have to obey their parents, or children only have to obey their parents if their parents are Christians. That would, of course, be a perversion of that text, for nowhere in Scripture are children given any right to disobey their parents. That should tell us that the phrase, in the Lord, can have different meanings in different contexts. Forgive me now for going over a little bit of grammar, but I must in order for us to completely understand this idea. In the Lord is what is known as a prepositional phrase because it has the preposition in followed in this case by a noun, the Lord. In some contexts, the prepositional phrase will act as an adjective, a word that describes or modifies the subject or object of a sentence, which would be the noun. While in other contexts, the prepositional phrase will act like an adverb, a word that describes or modifies the predicate of a sentence, which would be the verb. In Revelation 14, verse 13, the subject of the sentence, the noun, is the dead, and the predicate of the sentence, the verb, is die. From the context, the prepositional phrase, in the Lord, is modifying the subject, the noun, for it answers the question of which dead we're talking about. We're talking about Christians. In Ephesians 6, verse 1, though, the subject of the sentence, the noun, is children, and the predicate, the verb, is obey. From the context, the prepositional phrase in the Lord is modifying the predicate, for it answers the question of how or when a child is to obey. They are to obey in the Lord, meaning that whenever they can do so without disobeying the Lord. So let's now bring this knowledge and apply it to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39. Let's first identify the subject of this clause of the sentence, which, since we're talking about the widow of the man who died, the subject is she. Now let's see if there is an object in this clause sentence, the object being the one acted upon by the subject. In this verse, there is an object, whom, meaning the man that this widow marries. Now let's find the predicate or verb in the clause of the sentence, which is married. Our prepositional phrase, in the Lord, will either modify the subject, she, the object, whom, or the verb, married. 
If in the Lord modifies she, then the sentence would mean that the woman would need to be a Christian. Since this chapter is giving instructions to Christians about marriage, using this phrase here would be redundant. So we really can rule out that option. If in the Lord modifies whom, then the sentence would mean that the man whom this woman marries must be a Christian. And if in the Lord modifies married, then the sentence would mean the marriage itself must be according to the Lord's instructions and not prevent someone from living as a Christian. So which of these latter two options is it? Does the phrase modify the object of the sentence, the whom, and mean that whomever she marries must be a Christian, or does the phrase modify the predicate, married, meaning that the marriage itself must be according to the Lord's instructions and not prevent someone from living as a Christian? When we examine the entire context, including the immediate context, again the topic under discussion is living as a Christian even under times of persecution. And that would mean that the phrase in the Lord modifies the predicate and thus does not forbid a Christian from marrying a non-Christian. To further strengthen this argument, I'd like us to quickly recall Paul's instructions to the other two sets of people referred to in this chapter. He did not tell married Christians that they had sinned at any point by being married to non-Christians. If such was sinful at any point in time, one would have to repent of that sin, meaning that one would need to divorce their spouse. Paul says the complete opposite. Don't depart from your spouse, but live together amicably, if at all possible. And then when dealing with the never married, the set of people that would be in the same situation as the widow in verse 39, <clears throat> that phrase, in the Lord, is not used concerning their marriages. If, as a Christian, marrying a non-Christian was sinful, why wouldn't Paul use the same phraseology and give a commandment not to do so? For if it is sinful for the older single people to do it, it is sinful for the younger single people to do it. But Paul doesn't do that either, simply stating that if a virgin marries, they do not sin. So since I can find no command, no approved example, and no necessary inference that would tell me that it is sinful to marry a non-Christian, but I can find authority to marry someone who has a right to marry according to the scriptures, then what we must conclude is that the phrase only in the Lord in this context means by the Lord's authority, meaning that while it may be unwise to marry a non-Christian, it is not sinful, so, as long as that, so long as that person has the right to marry. Yet, in this time of persecution, it would still be better for the widow not to marry so that she would not be encumbered with the responsibility of marriage. However, if she did, she would not sin. And so this brings us to the end of this question sent to the Corinthians by, uh, sent by the Corinthians to Paul. In the next chapter, we will look at another question concerning idolatry and specifically meats offered to idols. Is it sinful to eat of them or not? We hope to join us for that discussion. With that, our time is up for today. The Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. As we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. We thank you for watching Walking Through the Bible today. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave them below. But if you like this video, we ask that you consider subscribing to our channel so you won't miss out on other videos in our series, as well as share this video among your friends so that the saving message of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world.